When police confront dangerous situations that threaten life and public safety, they call on a team of dedicated and specially trained elite officers called SWAT. Special weapons and tactics, these are their stories. Hello, I'm Robert Riggs here with retired Dallas Police Lieutenant Bob Owens, who spent 20 years of 40 years in SWAT, and today we're going to talk gun safety. And we're going to talk about it because, you know, the FBI has been posting uh, records of background checks, and those background checks usually refer to at least one gun sale, if not multiple gun sales. So it's already, as we speak in December 2020, up to more than 32 million checks. And so what we're already seeing is people are accidentally shooting themselves or discharging the gun at home and shooting into a wall. So, Bob, uh, you taught this to police officers for years, and they even have problems. (laughs) So let's start with the rules. Treat all weapons as if they are loaded. Okay. And that, that is to get into habit. Gun safety is a habit. And so, you know, sometimes that is written as all guns are always loaded. Well, you know, some somebody will say, oh, no, it's not. Look, it's not loaded. So you refer to it as treat them like they're loaded. That way you'll never, yeah. this is a aluminum gun, cast aluminum gun, can't fire, but you still don't point this gun at anybody. That way, if it's loaded or not, you don't get the habit of doing that. War story on uh, pointing guns at people. Had a rookie in the academy. And this is back when we had revolvers, and he was sitting on the in the back after a test. And they, at that time, they were carrying revolvers, like I said, like this one here. And but they they didn't have they didn't have firing pins in them. So he's sitting back there, and somebody asks him, "How'd you do on your test?" And he goes, "Oh," and he pulls his revolver out, sticks it to his head. Oh no. Well, he didn't have any bullets, or but but he got in the habit of doing that, right? So, and fortunately, a, a staff member was there, caught him, and they disciplined him. They chewed his butt out, uh, but he graduated mm-hmm. the academy. About two years later, he's a party, and there's such a thing as a, a disconnect on like a 1911 uh, type handgun, where if you depress the barrel, it won't go off. So he sees a person at the party. First of all, alcohol and guns obviously don't mix either. He says, let me see that. He points it at his chest, pushes it to disconnect the safety or the barrel, pulls the trigger, and guess what? It goes off. It's not a 1911. It was a copy of a 1911. It didn't have that feature. So that's why I say habits. Never point it at anybody. Uh... It's very important with, with any gun at any time. And so you've pointed out here, you know, this can even happen to trained police officers. Sure. You know, before journalism, I worked in Congress, and I'll never forget when I first got up there, I lived in a rooming house, and everybody else in that rooming house were uh, D.C. cops, most all Vietnam veterans coming back. Uh, it was the uh, uh, President Nixon had the war on crime. You know, Washington, D.C. was the crime center of the country. We're all sitting there. These guys always like to watch one Adam 12, and they would gather in the in the room with the TV room. One Adam 12. And one of the guys has got his pistol out, semi-automatic, to clean it. And messing around and pop the magazine out, and it's clean, and then, boom, shoots out the TV because... It was still around in the chamber. Kind of, that's something we've seen when you're you're doing training. What's the lesson there? Uh, well, obviously not. You shouldn't be cleaning a gun while you're watching television around <laughs> a bunch of people. But the the main lesson is with semi-automatic is you know you take the magazine out first. That's the source of the ammunition. But they're still possibly probably around in the chamber. Mm-hmm. So you take the mag out. You think it's empty. There's still one bullet in there. And that's what he did. Magazine out first, open the chamber. Hopefully you see a bullet come out. Then you still check it visually. You look in there. 
And then I always like to put a finger in there and physically check it. There's no round in there. Okay. But do not look down the barrel. Do not. Look yeah. Do down. not look look inside where the chamber's look, open. Yeah. Look in the back, not in the front. Yes. Uh, well, and of course, one of the rules is you've been going over. Don't point a weapon at anything if you're not willing to, to destroy it. Now, we saw that case of the couple in St. Louis who came out and she's waving a handgun around and and. If you are going to come out, something's going on. Some of you have got a prowler in your backyard. Where where do you point the gun? Uh, well, actually, at the ground. She mm -hmm. she made two major violations. She also had her finger on the trigger. Uh, he didn't. He seemed like he knew. You know, he had an mm -hmm. AR-15, uh, but she had her finger on the trigger and she was pointing it at people. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, I violated two of the safety rules. So you just said pointed at the ground. But talk about it really is relative to where you are. Maybe if you're on the second story of an apartment, you're not pointing the gun down. Right. Good point. Uh, we, we always say that like in classroom, uh, like right here, where is a safe? We say point, keep the weapon pointed in a safe direction. OK, that's easy on a gun range. It's towards the targets. But what if there's people down there replacing the targets? So then it's at the ground or up. Like you said, if you're in a, like we, we have a upstairs above us, so it wouldn't be up. Mm -hmm. Okay. It'd be in here. It would be down. It would, it would be for me to my left and down. Yes. Because if it does go off, it's going to hit this floor. Concrete. Yeah. And not hit anybody else. So that, that's the thing you have to, what is a safe direction? And a safe direction is if the gun does go off that no human life, no, no one will be injured or death, and only minimal property damage. So the property damage is the floor, the bullet will probably bounce. You know, it's it's embarrassing, but it's it's something you can survive as opposed to shooting a person. Well, uh, new rule number four of the big safety rules is be sure of your target and surroundings. Yeah, be sure what your target is, what's in front of it, and what's behind it, because it, it's not... Real life's not like a gun range. The targets don't sit there and there's a nice, you know, dirt berm behind it or a, a metal berm that you can shoot into. There's people behind it. There's citizens that are walking around in front of your, if you're in an altercation, you see this on body cam videos all the time. There's people all around. And so you got to be sure that this is your target and that there's nobody between you and that target or nobody directly behind them. And so when you're talking to people about license to carry in that training, uh, there are always questions about, you know, can I shoot people in my yard and stuff like that? And, or you know, if I'm feeling threatened, what's your common sense advice? Common sense. I, I think people always say that, you know, that, uh, can I, you know, yeah. uh, you know, but it, should you, should you exactly right. Can you, uh, and would you be justified? But are you really threatened? The, the point is, are you really honestly say that you are threatened? You are in fear of your life. Somebody's in my yard. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask them to leave or ignore them. You know, what are they going to do? Even if right, they tear up my grass, I don't know. But they try to come in the house, and it's a different story, especially if they're, they're going to yeah. break my door down. So common sense is you need to be in fear of your life. Honestly, in the way the law reads, you know, a reasonable person. So it, it's not totally, well, you, I'm, I was in fear of my life because they mm. were on my sidewalk. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't, a reasonable person wouldn't be in fear of your life. Now, if they're coming through my door, a locked door, and I've told them to stop, there's, there's a reason why they're not stopping. And so are you in fear of your life mm -hmm. then? Yes. That's the common sense. Yeah. You, you don't. You really don't want to do this. You don't want to use daily force unless you absolutely have to. And you should be prepared to do it if you absolutely have to, but only at that time because it's it's a life changing event for you and the victim of the of the shooting. When you go through firearms training, they'll teach you to keep a straight trigger finger, and that's off the trigger. Yes, because the closer you get to that trigger, the more chance under pressure that you can accidentally fire that gun 
It doesn't take, if, you're, if you've gone through any training at all, it takes milliseconds to get your finger from the side of the frame onto the trigger and pull the trigger. It's not, I mean, we've taught that in police departments yeah. for ever since we went to semi-automatic handguns, uh, 20, 30 years. So for home defense, are you better off in terms of being able to handle it and aim it with a short barrel shotgun? A shotgun, there's a shotgun's excellent if once you hit some, if you hit somebody, it's mm-hmm. pretty much yeah. uh, over. The problem is it takes two hands to operate a shotgun. Uh, so if when you fire one round, then you know it, unless it's a semi-automatic, you're going to need two hands to operate that shotgun. They usually don't have very many rounds capacity. Mm-hmm. Right. Four to six. Okay. I know yours says four. I think uh, it's devastating, but uh, it, it, you need to have a flashlight mounted on it. Yes. And yeah. uh, honestly, I, an AR-15 to me is it's a lot more controllable. Anybody can shoot it. Uh, there, or a pistol. But yeah, shotgun's fine. I have a shotgun at my house. You yeah, know, it's a pump shotgun. And if you know the fight's over, if you hit yeah. him with that thing. All right. So for our listeners, with this is also on YouTube. But for our listeners, you have brought three simulated guns. Uh, a revolver, and two pistols yep. uh, that are semi-automatic. Walk us through now what we need to learn. Okay. Uh, and we, we use these for, for safety reasons. There's nothing wrong with a revolver either. Uh, they've pretty much call, uh, gone out of favor with police departments for sure, and, uh, and home defense too, but they're still a very effective gun. The problem with a revolver is they're hard to reload. They're slow to reload because you got to put six bullets in six holes yes. in, the, in the cylinder after you fire the six. But you have six, six shots. Uh, I know in uh, when in New York NYPD they when they went to the Glock, they they had ten round capacity on their Glocks. Well, the cops were saying, you know, I've got I carry two revolvers, you know, one that you can yes. see and one a hideout. I've got twelve bullets, and now you want me to only carry ten, but. The difference is you can load that semi-automatic handgun a lot faster. So these guns are used for training, and that way you, if you do, you know, you still, again, point in a safe direction at all time, finger off the trigger. And uh, they're, they're excellent for that. And we use them uh, for training in the police department and uh, in our, our company now. We still use them for training. Second one is a, this is a Glock, I mean a SIG, Two two six aluminum aluminum yeah, yeah this is it. a uh, this is old uh, training gun for the police department. Uh, the problem with this was when anyway, one they're expensive. It's supposed to replicate the weight of a loaded two two six, which was our duty handgun. But cops being cops, you know when you're pre- when you're training, put the gun down, put the gun down. So you know it's. They don't care. They drop it. Where does it land? On their foot. And that thing hits your foot. It's gonna break. It's gonna break a bone. So they went to the plastic, plastic guns like that. And so in training, how would they use the aluminum? Just the basics of you know where to point, keep it down, that sort of stuff. Handcuff. Oh, everything. Everything to live fire. The the gun range. The the in our department, the gun range is separate from the police academy. It's in different physical locations. So everything live fire is done at the gun range. And everything with like defensive tactics, how to handcuff somebody, how to cover them, how to arrest them, get them out of a car, all that is going to be done with these guns Okay. for safety reasons. And uh, they also uh, use what they've come up with now, which I thought was really smart, is they take the barrels out of their real gun because they carry their real gun for almost the entire police academy. Just mm-hmm. get used to it because yes. it's, it's, it's hard to get used to. They take their barrels out at the range, and they give them what they call a blank barrel, and that's a plugged-up barrel that you can't— it's one-piece metal barrel that you can't mm-hmm. un, you mm-hmm. unplug it. All right. And then when you come to the range for training, they'll put your real barrel back in. So they'll use— Sometimes the real guns at the academy, but again, yeah. since they don't like them pointing guns at people, mm-hmm. 
in training, they'll use usually use the red guns or blue. Yeah. They sometimes they're red, sometimes they're blue. So now you know we have officers coming from uh, urban areas. Mm-hmm. I grew up in rural East Texas, where you know you were shooting a gun <laughs> at eight years old, and, right. you know, and taught safety and everything else. Uh, so we were kind of really accustomed to it. How many? I'm kind of curious. Coming into these academies, how many have ever even held a gun? It, it when we were really getting a lot of military people, it was yeah. a lot higher. Okay. But I'd say, uh, especially pistols. Now a lot of people, you know, I'm from the farm, or you know, I've I've shot a 22 or I've shot sure. a shotgun since I was a kid, but I've never shot a pistol, especially a semi-automatic, right, nine millimeter pistol. So I would say it's probably pretty close to 50 percent that. Uh, that did okay, and even the military people. You know, I, I was I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, we had 1911s back then. And I did we did what what they called fam fire. I fired six rounds through the gun. You know, no instruction. Walk up the line, pick it up. There's a the target. One, two, three, four, five, six. Put it down on the bench. Mm-hmm. Walk away. Uh, so that was the extent of my uh, knowledge from the service on how to shoot a uh, pistol. Now rifles different story sure but yeah there's quite a few that that did and you start from scratch and sometimes that's better than somebody that has preconceived notions you know about how to shoot yeah all right our next uh training weapon here is a glock but it's uh and it's got the day red on it indicating that it is not a live real gun real pistol right. walk us through on it now okay this is the uh, cert training pistol this is an excellent, it's the same weight as a loaded Glock. The magazine actually comes out, and the magazine is the same weight. actually looks like it has a little bullet on top. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. not. Uh, you can't open the, the sure. slide, so there's, it, there's no way this can fire. But it has a laser in it that you activate by pulling the trigger. And what you, what you work on with this is you can work on reloads, you know, how to load. You know, it comes with two magazines. Put another mag, drop the mag, put another mag in. Uh, you can work on your trigger. Most important thing in shooting, and we'll talk about this later in a different episode, but the basic is shooting. The biggest thing about shooting is your trigger control. And what you can do it, with your trigger is totally pull the gun. If you're on sights and you what they call jerk the trigger, you can pull the gun completely off target. I've seen people at the seven seven yards away from the target, shoot the, the dirt in front of the target. Because they're not squeezing. Because they're doing this. Yeah. And that, it's just because they're anticipating the recoil. Mm-hmm. And this has a laser. I don't know if, how we could show this. All right. And it allows you to, when you depress the trigger, so you line the sights up, mm-hmm. you line the sights up and then on a target, yeah. and then you want that dot to be right there. Maybe you can put the dot on our oh, no, I logo here. <laughs> See if we can see it. I don't know. I'll shoot him in the leg here. Yeah, there you go. See? Yeah. And then the, if you pull it all the way, there's two settings, one with the two. Yeah. And that, that what it's trying to get you to do is have those dots right over each other by pulling the trigger. You see how much it, that's yeah. just normal shake. Yes. Me. Yes. Uh, but they're actually, think about a target that's, you know, a, a, a person-sized target. Mm-hmm. And you're aiming at the center mass, and yes. you hit the dirt in front of it. That is a large movement of that gun. But people do it. So show us again how you're trying to keep the other laser above. And yeah, it's just right above what. it. Again, on the leg here. Yeah. Okay, I'm on the first one. That's the lower laser. Now the top one, which would go right on top of the sights. Mm-hmm. And these, there's a good training aids. Like I said, you can a lot of things you can't work on, but you can work on, again, reloads. And the most important... Uh, thing about shooting is the trigger trigger control and you can work on that and you work on your gun safety issues you know here's what I was talking about finger out, out along the slide outside the trigger guard until you're on target prepared to fire so again back to that earlier scenario I, I come out I'm going to be you know somebody's in my car I'm going to come out gun pointed down yes and let it make sure they see it as soon as they start coming up I'm going to I'm going to point it at them Mm-hmm. Get back. Still, you don't have your finger on the trigger. No, I still don't have my. The only time, the only time you put your finger on the trigger is you're actually going to shoot. So I'm not going to be here, you know, where I can make a mistake. Yes. 
I'm going to be here where I can feel the frame. This is very important. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show, you, show you those holsters back in the day, holsters, and how we used to train police officers and how it's changed. And the main reason it has is because of some automatic pistol. The trigger pull is a lot lighter. And so back then, when we had revolvers, we trained. I mean, I'm going to reach down and grab this revolver. This is a duty holster from the 1970s uh, with a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum revolver in it. Uh, notice the trigger. Trigger's exposed. The way we were taught, this is a, this is a pretty much, this is a pretty popular holster back then uh, for around here. This is made uh, in Oklahoma. And, uh, and it's big. Yeah, it's a big gun. It's a yeah. five and a half inch barrel. A standard duty gun revolver, like these two, these are four inch barrels, uh, approximately. This is Smith & Wesson. This is a little brother of this gun. So we were taught when you reach and grab the gun, you grab the trigger. That's why the trigger's exposed. And also notice the uh, retention here. All you had was this mm -hmm. strap they call mm -hmm. the suicide strap because it didn't do a whole lot of good. You had to reach down, grab it, unsnap it, and then, then re-attain your grip on the gun. And what you'd see officers doing a lot of times, if they're going to a call they think is hot, you know, violent, they'll take this strap and they'll push it out of the way. Problem with that is there's no retention in the holster now. This yeah. is, this one. rod or something's coming out. It'll fall out. Yeah. So compare that. Again, that's uh, from the 70s. These trigger on these Smith & Wessons or revolvers are over 10 pounds. So the theory was that you couldn't accidentally pull the trigger. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't true. You can accidentally pull it when you're excited. And mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, at least two, two or three that I know of when I was in narcotics that uh, one... Uh, one person got shot and the other two just went off into the, the hitherlands because the, the officer was, he was squeezing, he had his finger on the trigger and he's grabbed one time he grabbed the suspect. But when you, when you squeeze with this hand, you know, a little bit of that force goes on it, especially if you're excited yes. and the gun went off. Oh. So with, with a over 10, 12 pound trigger pull, you can still do that. So when we transition to the semi-automatics who are like, Five pound trigger pulls, the Glock being probably the most sensitive to that, uh, especially when it first came out, people weren't used to that. And you had, so we, you had people that would holster, we had it twice in our department. A person holstered a Glock with his finger on the trigger. Oh. So guess what happened? Oh, yes. They both, they went off. One, one just embarrassed him, the other one, he shot himself on along his leg. It wasn't life threatening, but it was certainly embarrassing and, and hurt. So let me get that other holster. So this is the modern version of that. This is a Safari Land, and you know it's a trigger. Big difference. Totally Mm -hmm. contained yes this is a level one holster one type of retention this is a level three a lot of, one of the problems with uh you know we always say in police work when there's when the police go to to uh interact with a citizen or uh, arrest somebody or just what uh, a radio call there's always at least one gun there and then the cop brings it so there's, there's a big, there was a big uh, spike in people taking the officer's guns away. You still see it. Yes. Uh, disarming the officer, especially with a holster like this, where there's no really very little retention. And you can see it. You know what's on this holster, there's three levels. There's tension, like this has. Yes. And then there's a strap as you reach and you... You see on that, you had to reach here, mm -hmm. pull it, and grab it. On this, 
in one motion, push down. That's your first retention. And then this knob here has to be rocked back, push that back, and then the gun comes out. All right, so somebody that has a license to carry, is this what you recommend for them? Or? No, this is more of a uh, type well, police type uh, rig or a, you know a tactical rig. Uh, it, it's you could use it for training. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, yeah. holsters for that. This yeah. main thing with this holster is weapon retention, and uh, it would be extremely difficult for somebody to get this gun sure. out of your holster. And there are plenty of dash cam videos from police officers on traffic stops where. They get in. They, they the bad guy tries to get the gun. You can oh, see yeah. him going, getting a hold of the holster and stuff. Yeah, yeah and you can see them. Uh, you know, I've, I've videos where there's four officers and one guy trying to get a gun, and it takes all four of them to get him off of that thing because yeah. uh, it, it's you know you grab hold of it and uh, people you know they, they don't want to give up. They don't want to go to jail, and uh, you know you're all in this big mm -hmm. gaggle of people trying to to stop them. Okay. These are, you asked about concealed handgun uh, holders, what type of holsters they should use. Again, they went from pretty much, this was a inside, there's basically two ways to do it, or three ways if you go the tactical route, but nobody, that's a range holster. But for people who carry uh, concealed, there's basically two ways. Outside the pants, which is pretty much just like it says, on your belt, uh, like you see traditional holster. These are belt loops. This holster, and again, this is Kydex. Uh, they're they're a lot cheaper than the leather, and they're they make the it's gun a little bit easier to conceal. You wearing if you're wearing this holster, you pretty much need a jacket or some outer mm -hmm. garment to cover mm -hmm. it up because it's yeah. it's on your hip. You're right. Well, I'm right handed. It's got to so remain concealed. These holsters are all right handed. So uh, that's but, and does it conceal the tr the uh, trigger? Yes. Okay. All these holsters that are made for semi-automatics do just that. They they cover the trigger. That's uh, that's one that has to go through your belt loops. So it's pretty much on there uh, until you you know you get home. This is uh, this is popular with uh, police also. This is. Uh, one that you could take on and off, like detectives, uh, people working in an office, uh, somebody, uh, you know, anybody that works in an office. Can synthetic seal. material there? Yeah, this is, again, Kydex. It's a type of uh, synthetic material. And this is made just to clip, to hook over your belt, so you take it on and off by yep. just yes. separating it out. Uh, not as sturdy. Again, that's, that's how the gun will look in the holster. Okay. The trigger is covered. The trigger is covered. Yeah. The notice on the retention, the only retention is the friction of how tight the, the yes. holster is. So there's no weapon retention involved yeah. here. And I notice when that. you do that, you keep your finger out in the position against the slide so it's not on the trigger. Right. Yeah. Just like that. That's yeah. how you come out. Right. There's no reason to put your finger on the trigger uh, in, unless you're on target prepared to fire. Again, you can be on target, but you're not prepared to fire, so I'm going to keep my fingers straight. Uh, again, this is this is the, seems to be the, well, this is, uh, uh, this is T-Rex Arms holster, this tan one outside the waistband. This is inside the waistband. This is a uh, DSG Arms, which is over near Fort Worth. And this is inside, this is the new, this is the most popular thing. Which you have me using. Is inside, yes. Yes. Inside the pants. And this, I always mark them because they all, you know, they're hard to tell which are which. This is right. for a Glock 19. Right. And you see the clip, I'm, since I'm right-handed, the clip's on the right side, and it's going to go inside my waistband, yeah. and this cl the belt's going to go right here. So you got to buy your pants a little bit a little bit bigger yes. to, because you've got that much that much extra, let's say, inch and a half of gun and holster. Okay, so but let's talk about where you position that on your pants because I keep mine more hip toward the butt, but I see people now are putting them up like around their crotch, yeah. which seems to me to be an accident waiting to happen. I just that is the preferred. I don't do it either. I'm uh, I, I keep it on my right hip and. It's called appendix carry. 
they used to, you know, they go through these fads. They used to have SOB, which is small the back, which is yes. just what you think it is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like how much time do you spend in a car or sitting? It's pretty uncomfortable. And it, same thing with the, the appendix carry. The appendix carry is literally right in front of your crotch, you know, and, and I'm worried about uh, my artery and I'm worried about my uh, going off. Uh, yeah. So I don't like it. Uh, you, you should you should be very, very careful. You know, I mean, how many times you can pull the gun out? But when I, if I did pull it out, I would be extremely careful putting it back in because you don't want to snag that trigger on a garment as you're going in the holster. And when I yes. talked about uh, you don't want to... Not so much that, because you know better than that, but you got a shirt, maybe a T-shirt, maybe a jacket in the way, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it can snag on that holster. Yeah. And five pounds will right. set this gun off. All right, so let's talk about the aorta. You were in Vietnam. I was in Iraq as a reporter, but I do remember the other side snipers, especially the Chechens, they would shoot for that aorta. Tell us about the deadly nature if you get hit there oh yeah i mean you, you bleed out very quickly and and it that close i mean we're talking almost contact distance. yeah that's running through your your inside of your thigh inside of your thigh femoral uh femoral artery yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that's your well, let's call them bleeders that's your big bleeder and you cut that and you know you need to get some help real quick it's real hard to to stop it's so high that you can't really yeah. use a tourniquet effectively yeah you need to get to the hospital as quickly as possible so i don't like it i like you know like i said on the hip closer yes. to my butt if it if it if it does go off uh you know it, it catches a little bit of skin and hopefully that's it yeah. but you know just the uh the muzzle blast even if the bullet doesn't nick it the gas is coming out of that thing is uh is going to do some damage and what i would recommend on that is when if you do draw the gun out i mean you should never this is this is something that people the people that have the accidental discharges what they call now negligent discharge which means it was your fault mm -hmm. are generally the people that are brand new to guns or the people that have been doing guns for years and years and years because they get complacent. The f first group doesn't know any better. The second group, eh, I, I got this. You know, I hadn't had a, I hadn't had mm -hmm. that ever happen to me. Yes. And then it does. So you got to be wary at all times. I would recommend if, you know, it's not something. <laughs> there's no reason to take this gun out of the holster unless you're finished. You're back home and you're gonna unload yeah. it or yeah. put it up. And I wouldn't even take it out of the holster. Put it in the gun safe. Uh, or whatever secure device you have, but that and that is the that is the most dangerous thing. If I had it inside the pants, and I would, if I had it out, mm -hmm. I would take the holster before I put it back in. I take my holster out of the pants and put the gun put, in. A, put the gun in, so I know the trigger's secure, yeah. and then put the holster back on the pants now. That's going to be real hard to do if you're holding somebody, uh, you know, until the police get sure. there. But, you know, you, you got to, if you can be real careful, you practice it. Uh, but you got to, with that, the biggest problem is the clothes. Clothes are in the way. So, um, just. Well, I think that's a good approach, though. Take the holster yeah. out before you reholster the gun. Yeah. Um, is for the, the new person, with the license to carry, is that the, you think that's the way to go if they're going to carry it on them and they want it in their pants? They should, holster. yeah. yeah. It, it, for the most concealment, it has. Yeah. It pretty much has to be in the pants. You know, in Texas, it's you know you don't wear that much clothes most of the year. It's yes. pretty hot. Wintertime is one thing. You know, it, uh, you can wear a big jacket and then you can mm -hmm. conceal anything, but. You got to think about it. Twelve months out of the year, you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt. How are you going to conceal that? So, uh, yeah, I would I would say that, or uh, you know, some people carry it like in a purse or uh, uh, a bat. You know, their uh, my my CPA he carries it in a, his suitcase or his uh, briefcase. 
you know, and all he wants to have it there, you know, from the car to his office. Yes. And back. So if you do carry it like in a purse or anything other than a, a you know, a, a holster on you, it's not attached to you. You've got to protect the trigger because in a purse, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there. Oh boy. And if that trigger gets caught, it, it would very well mm. likely to go off. So you need to yeah. make sure it's inside some type of secure device that protects the trigger from inadvertently hitting it. Yeah. So we talked about accidental discharge, and you call it negligent. Negligent discharge. Negligent discharge. What Are there civil or penalties? Are, can you get oh, charged yeah. under the law? Uh, it depends. You know, if there's... Uh, if it's accident, you know, it's negligent. They could they differentiated between the two because an accidental discharge technically is the gun's fault. It's something went wrong. One of the safeties failed on the gun. Okay. And a negligent discharge is your fault. So in the police department, if you have, if your gun goes off when it's not supposed to, what's, what do you think the officer says? Um, I didn't touch the trigger. You know, it's none of me. I didn't. I didn't touch the trigger. So they always say that, and you know, they're they're they know they're going to get in trouble. So we take the gun is taken. You know, they do an investigation. The gun is taken immediately. It's sent out to the pistol range, and the gun the pistol range checks the safeties on the gun. Yes. Do the, all the safeties work? Will the gun fire? just by pulling it out of the holster, right? or for instance, or whatever he says happened. And I, there was one case, it was an AR-15, that had been confiscated that it actually was the gun's fault. But uh, it slam-fired where you close the bolt and it goes off. But every other case, you have to pull the trigger. You know, these, especially these modern guns, mm -hmm. they have three safeties or more in them. And you have to do, you have to pull the trigger to make the gun go off. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's very, right. you know, if somebody gets hurt, obviously there's civil penalties or can be, you know, that the, you act, you know, you, you were at a, uh, well, I mean, look at the, the FBI agent, uh, not pick on one, but I think this is one everybody saw that was dancing and he did a backflip. Yes. His, gang, yeah. his gun fell out yeah. on the ground. Yeah. I mean, talk about having a bad day. Not only it goes off, which it's really not supposed to do, but then it hits somebody. Okay. Well, if that was your, whether that was you or your child that got hit, would you, mm -hmm. would you do anything about it? Would you sue him? Sure. So, you know, I, uh, so yeah, there you know it's it's it can be catastrophic. Yeah. I mean, it, sometimes it's funny. You know, we always say the difference between a, a funny negligent discharge and a tragedy is just dumb luck. You know, you you only violated one safety rule. So uh, it's it's a big responsibility. That's why you try to get across in the training what a responsibility this is that you now have that you're responsible for this weapon that will is made to kill it is you know i mean you can sugarcoat it all you want but that's what it's made for and it will do it and if you don't handle it properly and safely and with respect and so that's what we try to get across like i said and don't uh you know it's not something to play with it's not a, you know hey look i got this new gun let me show you no none of that uh it's it's all business when you're you're carrying a gun all right, so you want to move now to storage, or do you want to cover something else? Let's first? see. We talked. We got all the. I think all the holsters pretty much. Yes, in. and we know on the holster something that protects the trigger, and something that's got certainly the kind of tension that it just can't go flying out uh, easily. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's. Uh, the, and don't do somersaults don't or do flips. Back flips. It, it dances. It, it, well, you know, again. You know, I don't know if there's any drinking involved, but, yeah. uh, you know, generally... Well, that, that is the other thing. No drinking. Oh, no, no drinking. drinking. No. And, you know, it is interesting and out, out on YouTube how many videos are there of, of gang members 
messing around in the car with their pistol and bam, shooting themselves in the lap. You know, it's yeah, not just gang members. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. Hunters, you know. Yes, yeah. You know, a lot of people, you know, a lot. Uh, some people treat, you know, going hunting as a big drinking party. And, you know, there's. Oh, boy. Okay, we can do that, but we're we're going hunting, and then we put the guns up, mm-hmm. and then we have dinner, and if we want to drink, that's 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 up to you. But then we don't say, oh, uh, hey, let's get the guns out and shoot. You know, somebody needs, no, no, we're done with tomorrow morning. You know, we get back up on sobered up and we will shoot so yeah that that's a big part of the hold my beer and watch this type of thing you know that's uh extremely dangerous with guns because they're they're unforgiving you know if you make a mistake they're going to do what they're trained to do or made to do go off and where it's pointed is and with these one thing i forgot to mention earlier the most dangerous uh, gun is the smaller gun because you can point it at yourself very easily. Yes. So a longer gun, especially like a hunting type, you know, 22, 26 inch barrel. It's pretty long. It's pretty hard to point at yourself and you know where that barrel is. With these shorter guns, uh, not so much. Four inch barrel, three and a mm-hmm. half inch mm-hmm. barrel. Uh, it's, it, you, and generally they're pointed at you, at the, at the person, your hand, your legs. Yeah. So you gotta be extremely careful at all times. So when we see all these background checks, which you know, we know there's a lot of first-time gun buyers among that in multiple. Does it kind of scare you? You know what? What scares me the most? I think it's good. It, what scares me the most is that some innocent person who didn't know what they're doing, who just hey, I, I yeah. I've got I passed the background check. I went to the store, the gun store. I bought a gun. I brought it home, and I you know I'm good. So uh, next thing we need to get into is home storage. But main thing, you know, we always preach, and it's it's with our company or it's with any mm-hmm. company. Get training, get safety yeah. training. Uh, I, you know, I think most people should uh, get a concealed handgun license because that's an additional amount of training. And they talk a lot about the law uh, of deadly force yeah. and home storage and things like that. So all those things are very necessary to uh, to be a safe gun owner. And you mentioned our company. It's owenriggs.com, owenriggs.com. But this came about because we live in an affluent area of Dallas and a number of affluent people that I knew as a television reporter. Certainly you've known. I mean, you did the uh, protection details for uh, George H.W. Bush, the president, the vice president, and other. And so people have been calling like, because they're concerned about the violence they've seen in other cities and some in our city about, uh, Robert, what kind of gun should I buy? And I was like, well, you shouldn't buy a gun until you know how to use the gun. That's, And so uh, we're doing owenrigs.com. But this, again, you, need, you also need it fitted for yourself. And that's one of the things I've seen you do, particularly with women, your training of let them try out everything and let's see what they can handle. Because that's a safety issue, too. Sure, sure. And they, they will, you know, you'll see uh, the smaller the gun, d- depending on the caliber, but if you take a, uh, this is a 9 millimeter. Yeah. And this is a 9 millimeter. Okay, this is a lot bigger. And then there's smaller versions of this. The smaller, the lighter the gun is, the more it's going to recoil. And what I would what I'd see when I was teaching concealed handgun license, uh, years ago when it first came out was that that the a lot of first time women buyers would buy this gun with a two inch barrel it's called a chief special because your revolver yeah a revolver but that thing recoils like crazy yeah. you know the bigger the gun the less generally you know again it's physics the same caliber yes. you know 44 magnum it's going to recoil like crazy anyway but a little gun like mm-hmm. that so it's good we do it at Owen Riggs, we'll, you know, fit you for the gun. Any gun range has rental guns. You go there if if you don't want to use us, you want to go. You have a gun range near you. Just tell them I'm a first time gun buyer. You know, what do I need? Can I? What do you recommend? And can I try it out? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll put a safety officer with you, and you fire it. Well, everyone likes you because 
you were SWAT and the other people that assist you were SWAT. And I guess what differentiates you is just how much you have shot. You guys shoot thousands of rounds. Yeah, and uh, you know, several of the jobs I had. I mean, I was at uh, SWAT. I was in narcotics. The uh, uh, and the gun range, police academy. So all those places, uh, they're involved in firearms training. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's sad to say, but it's pretty much this way all over the country. That the annually in DPD they fire fifty rounds a year, five zero bullets that almost a year. Scares me. Yes, and that is not training. That's qualification. Yes. Now there is way to get extra ammunition that they've started which is good but most people don't take advantage of it but say 50 rounds a year and it's just the qualification course that's it and the specialized units SWAT narcotics primary primarily mm -hmm. shoot quite a bit more sure they have their own ammunition budgets yes uh, a few other small units do too but it's pretty much the vast majority the officers that you see driving around in their cars they've generally fire 50 rounds a, a year and uh, just totally uh, not enough you know the handgun's a hard thing to master so it, it takes some training and but, then we talk about defund the police yeah and they're only funding 50 rounds a year yeah it's gonna be hard to get five million dollars out of out of 50 rounds a year for, for yeah. an officer it's it's not happening I mean uh, the training is you know unfortunately it's it's all about money. Yeah. You know, it's time off the street, and it's it's paying for the ammunition or whatever the, the training supplies you use. Well, some of the high-profile, awful events we've seen, such as Floyd, you know, what I see is lack of background checks on the officers, lack of training, scrutiny. But what I always saw as a reporter, the first thing cut— the first thing is the training budget, yeah. which is the thing that can have the deadly consequences. Yeah, we used to, our, our uh, fiscal year went from, uh, uh, ends in October. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, summer months are, uh, you know, more crime in the summer yeah. months. Kids are out of school. Uh, so uh, we get our training budget money in October. Well, we would spend it as fast as we could because about June or July, they come take it back because we need it for overtime or mm -hmm. something else. So we would we would try to burn it through it by March where the yeah. lower crime months. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and, and that was for a specialized unit. Patrol gets zero. I mean, the only training is done is in-house by the department and uh, the state requires 40 hours every two years but uh that's it and then so you go to a class 40 hour class every two years and you shoot your qualification course okay. once a year all right let's talk about storage because this is really important to protect your children you know and i've told you the story that you know my dad world war ii my uncle were all world war ii vets in those days they brought back all kinds of stuff yeah. and i still remember as as a kid for years looking at this top shelf in my dad's closet and it had shoe boxes and I knew there were these guns in there and German Lugers and I always wanted to get up there and get them now I, you know I knew what would happen but I am telling you a child is curious so walk us through the the best storage the best storage is lockable storage that uh that only you can get into, you know, a gun safe, uh, or even a large gun safe or a small, you know, gun safe for one, mm. one gun or two guns that you, with a combination lock on it. Uh, the, the minimum is, we don't have any of those here. The minimum is a, a lock that goes through the barrel and the action of the gun. Yeah. And these are provided. If you buy a gun new, it's going to have a gun lock in it. And that's a safety program. The gun industry is done. Uh, we used to get boxes of these at the substations, police substations, and they'd say, please give them out to anybody who wants Yes. Them. So they're just pretty simple. It goes through, and it won't let the gun operate. Locks, you have a key. Yeah. Now, the problem with that is, obviously, so, if you need it in a hurry, can you get to it in a hurry? Can right. you unlock, can you find the key, can you get to mm -hmm. it? 
uh, I think a better. And better, there's, I've seen a lot of people don't use them. It's got that no, loop on it that goes through. And, yeah, it goes through the. Um, yeah. Uh, a you know one of those if you just you just want one handgun for self defense one of those small say like a shoebox, but it has a combination lock on it and you push the Digital. buttons and you keep the gun loaded, uh, and you push the buttons the door pops open you reach several manufacturers find them at any major sporting goods stores gun stores gun ranges sell them. locksmiths I got mine yeah, at locksmiths locksmiths, yeah. locksmiths sell them. So that, that's the thing. It's, there's a law in, in Texas and in many states making a, the one in Texas called making a firearms accessible to a child. And that is uh, any, anybody under 17 is a quarter of the state's a child. And if you make it accessible to them, like your father did, and my father did too, and I did for my daughter, uh, but she was, you know, she was mature enough to, you know, we had a big talk about guns. And that's, I think that's the thing, you know, when you get back to your father, you know, maybe if he sat down with you and showed them to you and explained, you know, besides I'm going to, you know, I'm going to whip your butt. Yeah. But here's how it works. And these things are very dangerous. Uh, you know, separate the ammunition from the gun. I mean, he didn't have them as a home defense. He had them. Yeah, Just and there was no there was there. no ammunition. No, they weren't loaded. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, kids. You like, never know what a kid will do. Oh yeah, kids. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. I think my my friend Bill, he's got some of that ammunition that'll fit in that gun. He'll bring it over. You know, I mean, they'll. Yeah. And you know, you say, well, my kid's an angel. You know, he would right. never, he or she would never do that. Well, what about his, their friends? Would their friends do it? Oh, come on, we can get up there. So it's very important. Keep it locked up. Um, and when the when the child's old enough, I think they should be taught about it, and you know, and just un, like we've talked about how yes, de- you know, this this thing can kill you right here, and you, you got to respect it, leave it alone. You know, we'll go to the range, and I'll show you how to use it when you get old enough. But uh, it's not a toy; it's not something to play with. There's a lot, especially the younger kids; they think it's a toy. Oh yeah, look at that. Well, you see so much of them in movies, yeah. and stuff, and I don't know that. You ever see safe handling practiced in the movies? Not much, but there, there yeah, yeah there, there's some. It's it's hard. You know, people nitpick movies all the time about gun safety, and you see this on the Internet. And But, you know, they don't really care. I mean, this, we're making a movie here. But, uh, you know, it's hard to – I mean, it's something you got to be thinking about all the time, you know, when you're handling the gun, when it comes out of the holster, or when you're presenting it, you know, who's, who's in front – Who's in front of me? Who's around? I mean, it's uh, it's it's intense, and they don't really, you know, I don't, right. I don't think they, they're not who to follow. And besides the people, you know, they would just get winged in the arm, mm-hmm. you know, on their yeah. back next episode, and they're fine. So, all right, we're gonna close out this episode of SWAT Brothers. I you got one, anything else here for us? No. All right. So no, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna hit the big four safety rules as we close. Treat all weapons as if they are loaded. Never point a weapon at anything that you are not willing to destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you are ready to fire. And finally, be sure of your target and surroundings. Because even if you have license to carry and you're feeling threatened, you have to be aware of. You know, if I shoot, is is there somebody innocent? that I might hit here too might not be the best thing to do. All right, Bob, thank you. That's this week's SWAT Brothers on gun safety. SWAT Brothers is a trademarked and copyrighted news show hosted and written by Robert Riggs and Robert Owens. Audio production by Siler Burr. Original music by Blair King. Social media producer Grace Woodward. Publicity Tim Livingston PR. Graphics, Brian David Kerr Designs. Thanks for listening, and remember to practice gun safety.